Okay, well welcome everybody. Um, I know people are still milling about getting food. That's no problem. Please help yourselves to food and drink. Um, so my name is Howie Ree, and this is the 18th Duke Gen Startup Showcase. This is our eighth year in, uh, our ninth year, excuse me, in San Francisco. We are so thrilled to be at WeWork Embarcadero Center. Uh, thank you to Nick Melionis for making this happen. New Nick is a Duke alum who, who made this all happen. Let's give Nick a round of applause. <clears throat> and thank you to my many uh, co-organizers. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. Dave Perkins, Chase Olivieri, Jen Snook, Tracy Rotter. Uh, I probably missed a few people. Monica Hirschbickler, Coco Chen. Let's give them all a round of applause too. They've worked really hard on making this event happen. <laughs> I'm sorry if I missed anyone. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna go through a few slides here just to give you an overview of Duke Gen and what you're gonna see tonight. And then we're gonna go right into the pitches. And after the pitches, we're gonna have a happy hour at Schroeder's at 240 Front Street. So I hope you'll join us there. So. Um, before we jump into what Duke Gen is, uh, let's just see a show of hands. How many of you have never been to a Duke Gen event before? Raise your hand if you've never been to a Duke Gen event before. Okay, so it's about half of you. So for you, this is all gonna be new information. So the question that Duke Gen tried to answer when it was started back in 2008 was, how do you connect folks that are Duke alums that are interested in startups? And so we created the Duke Global Entrepreneurship Network. Um, and our tagline is Productive Connection. So hopefully tonight, if you haven't already, you're going to meet one or two people at least that are going to be somehow productive and useful for you or you to them. And that's the whole reason for Duke Gen being here. And the way that Duke Gen started is that we started as a LinkedIn group. Uh, back when we started in 2008, we didn't have anybody on. And now we have about 7,000 Duke alums and students on the group. We're one of the largest entrepreneurship groups on LinkedIn. And then we realized that, hey, we should do this on Facebook too. So we've got about 4,000-ish members on our Facebook group. We've got posts there every day. We started a Slack uh, a, this past year. We've got 1,000 Duke alums on Slack. Um, if you haven't joined, please do. Uh, it's dukebullpen.slack.com. And so we've done a lot of online stuff. And we said, hey, can we start to do offline stuff too? So back in 2009, we started hosting these networking events in multiple cities on the same nights. Basically said, hey, are there any Duke alums that want to host an entrepreneurship event in their city? Just raise your hand, and we'll help you make that happen. So since 2009, we've hosted about 300 different events in cities around the country and even internationally. Um, we get a lot of requests for, from Duke entrepreneurs that are along the lines of, hey, I'm starting a company, I need investors, who should I talk to? So we regularly share lists of Duke investors with them. We've got about two or 300 that we've cataloged. Um, we've written up stories of different Duke entrepreneurs, uh, many of which uh, you haven't heard of, but some of which you have. For example, the founders of these companies, Melissa and Doug, Min.com, Zico Coconut Water, are all Duke alums, and we can name a bunch more for you. Uh, Coinbase says one. Um, I'd have to think a little bit more off the top of my head, but there are a bunch, and uh, we're always trying to capture those stories and spread the word. And so we come to this event here, and this event was started by a Duke alum uh, who suggested this, Jim Scheinman, where back in 2010, he said, hey, you know, these all the things that you've been doing are great, but what we would really uh, ought to be doing is getting Duke startups to pitch to Duke um, investors. And so that's what today's event is about. So these Duke startups pitch to these Duke investors. Um, one of them who's here today, Josh, raise your hand. Josh, is, he's an original gangster here. He's been with us since the beginning and has been to pretty much every single event. Um, so we pitched at what was then Dogpatch Labs, um, Pier 39, I think. Um, which was a fantastic space. That's where Instagram, uh, the Instagram founders met. And so that was back in 2010. It was so successful, we said, let's do this in New York City. So that October, we did it in New York City. Again, Duke startups pitching to mostly Duke investors in front of a Duke audience. This was at um, Dogpatch in Union Square. And so since this event has started, we've had um, some really interesting successes. Uh, Mike Brown is a Duke alum who he raised $100,000 at this event two years ago. Uh, Catherine Minshew, she's raised well, well over 1.2 million. She runs The Muse. 
Uh, final card, they were just acquired by Goldman Sachs. Uh, that was uh, Andrew Dietrich. He pitched at this very event about four years ago. Coverhound, they've raised uh, over 30 million now. Uh, they pitched at this event. And so there's a bunch of startups that have pitched at this event that have gone on to uh, actually raise money. And so we're pleased to play a small role in helping spread the word. So Duke Gen is a lot of things, but really it's about this community. I hope you'll meet each other tonight. I hope you'll join our online forums and come to our events that are held uh, three times a year here in the Bay Area. Um, just a couple more things, and then Salman, uh, where are you? I'm gonna have you come up and talk a little bit about the Duke Angel Network, if you're cool with that. So um, for those of you that are running companies in the Bay Area and you wanna hire Duke students, um, please just send us an email. We do uh, whatever we can to connect Duke students to startups in the Bay Area. Um, and we have great people like Josh who, who have taken Duke interns for many years. Uh, it's really great. We host, a, if you want to come back to campus, I know it's a bit of a trip from the Bay Area, but if you do want to come back to the campus, we do host a networking fair uh, for startups every February. We usually have about 600 students that come to that event. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Salman. Salman is a Duke alum. He's also a, a Duke professor, and he's also running the Duke in Silicon Valley program along with Kevin in the back there. Um, and he was recently named the Managing Director of the Duke Angel Network. So Salman, um, if you are willing to just introduce yourself, I've got a couple of the standard slides here. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so I'm also a Duke dad, so if there's anything left at Duke that I haven't done, I am still will waiting to get a chance to do that. Uh, so uh, essentially I'm uh, now running uh, Duke Angel Network. It was started by John Glushik. Uh, he's already uh, brought us to about 125 members. We are all over the world and a few foreign countries as well. And uh, we typically have, uh, we right now have exactly 20 investment. We just uh, closed on our 20 investments. Uh, let's see, um, we evaluate about 200 uh, deals a year. Total invested capital now has is 9 million. Um, average total is investment per deal is now about 400,000. But also, uh, if you look at the last few deals, uh, we are over $600,000 average uh, per deal now. Uh, so uh, we are seeing more deals and we are seeing better deals uh, come through it. Uh, typically, we invest in companies that are from a few million to 20 million or so uh, there. And these are some of the companies that we have invested in, uh, Babies, Golden Key, et cetera. Uh, they are all over the country, as you can see. We invest only right now for, um, because it's just easier for legal and financial reasons, we only invest in companies that are based in US um, or at, at least registered in US, even if they do international business. Uh, more companies. Um, these are the, uh, oh, this is back to you, I guess, yeah. now. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Salman, appreciate it. It's a quick intro. Let's give him a hand there. Okay, so I'm gonna have each of our panelists come up uh, here. So the way this event is gonna work is that each company is gonna have four minutes to present, and then we're gonna give them one minute of questions from the panelists. Uh, normally we have the panelists sitting uh, over on the side so we can see each other here, but um, uh, just due to space constraints, we actually decided just to let them come up sit up here, and then when they want to ask their questions, they're just going to come up and stand next to the presenter. So we're going to start with uh, Song. If you don't mind coming up and introducing yourself, we'll go to Jake next, Bob after that. Hi, everyone. My name is Song. I graduated from Duke in 2012 and majored in economics. Um, since graduating, I've popped around and done a whole bunch of different roles, but currently am a consumer and emerging tech investor for uh, the Comcast Ventures platform. Thank you, Song. And all their bios are in the program there. Jake, if you don't mind coming up. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Jake Flomenberg. Uh, I'm a partner at Excel and a Duke alum, graduated in 2005. And uh, Excel, for anyone who doesn't know, is a global venture capital firm with offices uh, here, London, India. And we invest uh, at all stages from seed up through uh, large growth equity, uh, mostly in consumer and enterprise tech, although I focus a little bit more on the enterprise side. Thanks. Thank you, Jake. Here's Bob. This is Bob's third year being a judge. Yes. Bob Gura, uh, Duke Law, class of 97, so um, about 20, 20 years ago. Uh, I've 
uh, been both an operator and an investor um, here in Silicon Valley for the past 20 years. And uh, these days, I'm mostly investing in early stage, um, uh, one to $10 million check sizes. Next up is Josh, who this is his ninth year being a judge here. Thank you, Josh. Which means I'm the oldest panelist. <laughs> nice to meet all of you. I actually saw 25 of you yesterday in our offices, so it's nice to see you all again. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I started two companies, one in the 90s called Spinner, and then one called Grouper Crackle in uh, 2006. And uh, I'm, I switched sides um, in 2011. I started a venture capital fund called Freestyle with the same guy I've worked with for 22 years. We're now three partners, and we are early stage investors. Nice to meet all of you. Thank you, Diana Moldavsky. This is her third year as a panelist. Hi, I'm Diana. Um, I'm uh, Fuqua 2010. Um, great to see you all here in San Francisco. Um, I'm currently angel investing and advising um, startups and some funds and family offices. And before that, I was a partner at 500 startups. And before that, I did 15 years of operating on business side of uh, tech companies and startups. Uh, worked with companies like Google, Yandex, and um, and my last operating role was chief revenue officer at a mobile gaming company um, that created Cut the Rope. Um, so um, yeah, great to see you all. Thank you, Diana. Now, Robert, this is Robert's second year, and uh, Robert works with Jim Scheinman, who I mentioned earlier, who came up with the idea for this, this event. Hey, everyone. I'm Robert Ravanchanas. I've been at Maven Ventures since 2015 when I graduated from Duke. Um, we're early stage investors focused at the seed stage in consumer software and transportation startups. Very good. And our last panelist is Salman, who already said hello, but I'm going to let him say I'm going to say hello again. I am uh, running uh, Duke Angel Network. Before that, I was a serial entrepreneur. Uh, entrepreneur. Weetabix is my favorite serial, for those of you who know what Weetabix is. Um, and uh, I also, like Josh, went over to the other side, but not in such a big way as Josh has done, uh, more as an angel investor and limited partner. And uh, now I'm kind of uh, sniffing for good companies and good entrepreneurs, actually good entrepreneurs and good ideas in that order uh, over here. Very good. Thank you. OK, so um, with that in mind, uh, we are going to start the pitches. Just one thing. So after all the pitches go, uh, we're going to have the judges uh, go ahead and decide on their favorite pitch. And they're going to give feedback on all the companies here live. Um, and then we're also, you, the audience, you get to vote for your favorite company. So if you have your phone with you and charged up, you're going to be able to vote for your favorite company. Uh, so with that, let us start the pitches. And the first one is NeuroPlus. Let's give a big round of applause for Jake. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Jake with NeuroPlus. And we are improving cognitive health with brain sensing technology. So our mission at NeuroPlus is to build better brains, to give you the tools and the technology you need to train and develop your mental performance and mental health with the same sophistication that you train your physical performance and your physical health. And we're starting with the problem of attention. Attention is your brain's ability to take in the information around you and decide what's important and what to focus on. We all have problems paying attention. But these problems are particularly debilitating for people with ADHD, with autism, with age-related cognitive decline, and with traumatic brain injuries. For these people, attention deficits are really serious. And this is a huge industry. Last year, we spent more money on ADHD medications than Hollywood took in at the box office. So NeuroPlus provides a solution. We have a product that's proven to improve your ability to pay attention. And the way it works is users wear a proprietary headset that measures their brain activity. And they play a training video game that challenges them to focus. So that the more that they focus, the faster a dragon will fly or the faster a ship will sail. In this way, they actually practice the act of paying attention so that the more their brain expresses patterns of brain activity, associated with focus, the better they do in the game, and the more they develop these skills. 
And I'm not just saying this, we actually conducted a randomized controlled blinded clinical study with researchers at Duke and Stanford that found that kids that use NeuroPlus dramatically improved their ability to pay attention. We saw huge reductions in inattention and hyperactivity, impulsivity improvements in executive function, reductions in aggression, oppositional defiance, and learning problems. Um, and what's really interesting is we saw improvements that were on average four times greater than improvements seen in kids using traditional treatments like Adderall or behavioral therapy. And it's not enough that it works, we also wanted to make it accessible. So we priced this at $99 plus $30 a month so it's, it's accessible to the vast majority of families, uh, individuals, and children with attention problems. And that's really paying off for us. Since launching at the end of 2017, we've seen over 250,000 in sales from over 700 customers. And our research and our company has been featured in Rolling Stone and Forbes, IEEE, and VentureBeat. Importantly, we're really just scratching the surface. So we have this attention product that's done very well. We, seen, we th see that there's a large market there with 25 million people just in the US with an attention problem. But ultimately, we have broader applications, uh, an attention training product for the mass market, products for individuals suffering from anxiety that want to improve their relaxation, a really interesting application, Alzheimer's, that we filed for a patent for today, and ultimately applications in brain-computer interfaces. We've got the right team behind this. I'm a Forbes 30 under 30 entrepreneur. I was a neuroscience researcher at Duke. Our CTO led software development at the University of Amsterdam's Brain and Technology Lab. We've got a couple other Dukies on the team as well. And combined, me and Jeroen have spent the past 10 years developing software and hardware for EEG and brain-computer interfaces. So we've identified a really serious problem. We've built a product that works. We've demonstrated early market traction. And now we're raising $2 million to scale our customer acquisition efforts and to start laying the groundwork for product extensions. With this money, we'll have 24 months of runway to reach 15,000 subscribers with $6 million in annual recurring revenue. Thank you so much. Happy to answer your questions. So uh, we're going to take a minute's worth of questions from the panelists. If you don't mind, just uh, stepping up and asking your question if you have one. Jake. Sure. So I would have to imagine that a huge chunk of the current spend in this industry is actually coming from insurance providers who are covering many of these costs. This looks like a direct to consumer only model. How did you come to that decision? And is there also a... Yeah. So the out of the out of pocket costs are actually pretty large. So the typical family spends over $2,000 a year on out of pocket costs for ADHD. So the market size is actually very large in the out of pocket. Obviously, insurers are covering a lot of this, but insurers are also looking at uh, general wellness and, and wellness products that they can incentivize their members to use. So we're actually talking to insurers now like Blue Cross Blue Shield about providing this as a, a wellness product for their members to use to try to lower and, and bend the cost curve for other medications. What's the natural uh, useful life of this product? Is it, you know, at what point um, does the marginal benefit of, of using this diminish once, uh, you know, the initial benefit's been recouped? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's very much like a, a physical training program where you see a lot of benefits in the first 10 weeks. That's how long our study lasted. Eventually, we imagine those would taper off, but people want to stay involved. One, because we're producing more training content, but also because they want to maintain the results. Just because you get fit, doesn't mean you stop going to the gym. You want to keep that, that maintenance up. So that's where we see the usage pattern is an intense period to get to a certain goal and then maintenance over time. So I know, I know uh, getting a reimbursement code is kind of gold. And if you can get that, <laughs> it's like you know, you're off to a billion dollar company. But while you're waiting for it, you mentioned that you're raising money to grow your customer base, but you just didn't mention your strategy for customer acquisition. So what are you thinking about? What do you think your CAC will be What's your lifetime value? Absolutely. So over the 700 customers, I'll try to answer quick. Over the 700 customers required, we've seen a CAC averaging $50 per customer, which we think is pretty good. That's mostly come through Facebook and PR work. We'll, we'll definitely scale that up. We also have a retail, retail opportunity with CVS Health has approved us for a pilot in CVS stores around the country. So that's exciting. And then we're seeing a lot of interest from doctors, physicians, clinicians that want to refer uh, their patients to this. So that's another channel for us. Very good. Let's give Jake a round of applause. <laughs> Okay, next up is Nikhil with Phone Health. Let's give Nikhil a round of applause, please. 
Hi everyone, my name is Nikhil Viswanathan. Um, I'm a Duke grad, class of 15, and um, I'm a co-founder of Bone Health Technologies, and we're all about osteoporosis prevention. So please raise your hand if you're over the age of 50 or have a loved one over the age of 50. Should be about everyone in the room, right? So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but statistically, one in two women and one in four men over the age of 50 will suffer a fracture from osteoporosis in their lifetime. Um, these fractures can be pretty serious. Um, for men who sustain a hip fracture who are over the age of 50, they have a 25% chance of dying within 12 months, which is super significant. In addition, um, about $19 billion are spent per year on osteoporosis-related fractures in the US. So there's a huge um, human and economic cost uh, and motive for preventing osteoporosis. But the real cause behind the osteoporosis epidemic is really a prevention gap. So there are two main ways to prevent osteoporosis today. Um, uh, the first being pharmaceuticals, and the New York Times headline says it all. Fearing drugs' rare side effects, millions take their chances with osteoporosis. So the sad fact is 75% of patients will discontinue use and go off their doctor's recommendations within 12 months when they're supposed to be using these things for years. Um, the second option they have is weight-bearing exercise, which is actually fairly effective, but that's defined as daily high-impact exercise such as running or weight training. And as many of you know, and as the studies show, uh, most older adults just can't keep up with that kind of weight-bearing exercise and that exercise regimen. So really the opportunity is a consistent manageable treatment to prevent osteoporosis. Our solution is the OsteoBoost belt. We're uh, leveraging about 20 years of research, first started by NASA and then followed up by major academic centers into um, what's called whole body vibration or therapeutic vibration, which mimics weight-bearing exercise to build bone mass and prevent osteoporosis. Um, the use case of this product is that it's worn around the waist like a normal belt, three to five sessions per week for about 10 to 20 minutes per session. Um, the device is easy to use, portable, and user-friendly. Um, it's digital health enabled. We have a companion app um, for iOS and Android which can be used to um, track compliance um, and also to receive daily usage reminders. The belt works as well. Uh, we actually just wrapped up a 17 patient clinical study. So on the graph on the left, each of those patients, each of those lines represents a patient. And uh, the downward trend of each of those lines um, suggests that um, each patient saw a reduction in bone loss as measured by, the, by a, a, a bone loss biomarker, a bloodborne biomarker. The average, um, the average uh, reduction in bone loss was 14%, which is um, on par with results for pharmaceutical medications after 12 months and on par with weight bearing exercise. This data was published this year by the Orthopedic Research Society. We've also done some consumer research to understand what our future market traction might be. Um, we conducted a focus group with uh, postmenopausal women and we found out that women in the 50 plus age group are very aware of the risks of osteoporosis and most if not all have a story of a friend or something who um, had a bad, uh, a bad experience with the medications and so they're aware of the risks of taking the medications as well. So they're looking for another solution. Uh, it's we had them try on the product, it's comfortable and easy to use, and we were able to set the price point at $399 based on their responses. Not one of the focus group participants blinked at that price. We also conducted a survey of 463 postmenopausal women and found that about 98% said that they would follow our recommended use case, which is um, three to five times a week again for 10 to 20 minutes per session. And we also asked them how they would expect to find out about this so we know what our marketing channels are. And so that would be uh, mainly online. Older people are more and more becoming more and more active online. So search engine, social media, and through their physician, obviously. Uh, for some company history, right now we're funded by two grants from the National Institute of Aging. We've taken in $2.2 million in completely non-dilutive funding. Uh, the funding process involved um, pretty extensive scientific and business review by a panel of experts. That provides the majority of capital for us to get to, to market and be cash flow positive. And we're actually opening our first public round now to kind of fill that out. Uh, the technology was developed at Theranova, which is an established medical device incubator in San Francisco. Just to go through the team real quick, um, we have Dan Burnett, who's sitting in the audience right there. Serial entrepreneur who's founder of Theranova has founded 10 medtech startups. Mike Jasma, who did his PhD thesis on bone cell responses to mechanical stimulation, was with the FDA, former lead reviewer and branch manager. I'm a multidisciplinary multi engineer. And lastly, we have Gabe Griego, who's our sales and marketing guru, guru um, in the physical therapy and sports med space. And he was previously with Power Bar, Game Ready, and Alter G. Thank you. Okay, questions from the panelists. Who would like to go first? Super interesting. Um, 
versus what? So this type of therapeutic um, device versus surgery versus Medicaid, uh, and what is kind of the efficacy of your solution? So uh, r our, our target market is really um, preventing osteoporosis. And so like I mentioned uh, in, the, in the deck, um, there are two main ways of doing that, uh, mainly pharmaceuticals and weight-bearing exercise. So we are an alternative to both of those which have poor compliance rates. And because of that are basically ineffective therapies. So you said that at 399 nobody blinked. Have you considered raising the prices or having different price levels on, uh, with different affinity groups or uh, just getting a little bit more on the table? So uh, we think 399 is the sweet spot because we actually first asked the, the um, participants how much they would expect to pay for a device like this. And we got kind of a range between about one to $600. Um, but then we said, well, what if we kind of met in the middle at, four, at 399 and everyone, was, everyone said that would be acceptable to me because my bone, my bone health is important to me. A uh, quick one. Um, so what gives you the belief that your compliance rates will be higher than these other solutions? So um, we've had about 30 patients participate uh, in our clinical trials so far. 95% uh, rated the device as very easy to use and comfortable. It actually feels quite soothing like a massage. And so um, they basically rated that they would be able to use it every day. Um, but we're conducting a longitudinal trial at the end of this year, which will help us learn more. Very good. Thanks, Takiel. All right, next up is Jada with Hurry Home. Let's give her a round of applause. Hi, all. Um, I'm Jada McLean, and I am actually the CEO of Hurry Home, where we strive to build home ownership block by block. So quickly about Hurry Home. What we do is we offer alternative financing through a shared ownership model for houses that banks cannot profitably originate mortgages for. So we enable renters to become homeowners. Let's start with Susan. She's a municipal employee. She makes about $43,000 a year. Her current rent is $775. She has a daughter, and she loves the house she lives in and thinks she can actually afford it. But, but she's like, you know what? She doesn't really have enough credit history to potentially give her um, a, bank, a bank mortgage, but she's been a great renter over the past seven years. So she looks at this house in South Bend on Cottage Grove, three bed, one bath, perfect for her and her daughter. And she and the purchase price is fifty thousand dollars, and the estimated monthly payment with Hurry Home would be eight hundred dollars. The problem is, she goes shopping around for a mortgage, and there's limited mortgages available for these low-cost homes and would-be affordable homes. And why is that? That's because banks do not make money, or they don't make a profit due to regulations on these homes. This is a big problem, right? There's 8 million renters in these secondary tertiary markets that make $40,000 that would love to own a home. And this housing step, and particularly this bottom tier market, represents a $54 billion market opportunity for Hurry Home. How we propose to solve this is through an alternative investment vehicle where a buyer chooses a desired house, qualified buyer chooses a desired house. Hurry Home facilitates cash purchase of this house with pooled investor funds, and then the buyer purchases this house, pieces of this house, month to month, with their rent payment back from these investors. So at any, any given point, investors, pool investors, and buyer have an ownership stake in this house. And the investors, as a result, earn a monthly return on these dollars invested. How do we find our buyers? We are testing this this summer. And the main ways we've been going about it is digital, so Facebook ads targeting specifically renters, and direct mail, so mail directly to renters' residences and tell them about Hurry Home Service. And lastly, through partnerships, we, the nonprofits, local nonprofits, they would benefit from relationships with a Hurry Home to add to, add to their services that are already offered to their um, client base. And on the investor side, we've t already tapped into kind of accredited investors on an individual basis that are 
already looking to um, diversify. Maybe they already have investments in real estate. Um, our next, we're poised to tap into banks that have a community and, re and reinvestment act obligation. And what that means is that they have to invest in these low to moderate income families and people. And city governments, public private partnerships where city governments are working to solve this affordable housing issue. So our business model, Hari Home's main revenue stream is a portion of that monthly payment. And our ancillary revenue streams would be a monthly service fee, um, brokerage fee, and then a management fee to that pool of investors. Where we've come so far is we've secured $80,000 donation from the city of South Bend that would serve as um, first loss position for all these deals, as well as buyer support services like down payment assistance and, and home ownership counseling. Uh, we have gotten some traction on Facebook with, with organic Facebook posts, uh, where it's 250 clicks, which has actually resulted in our first five qualified buyers. And we've secured seven partnerships with local nonprofits in South Bend that have sister organizations across the nation. And we've also secured $25,000 in business competition prizes at the Notre Dame um, business competition. And lastly, we've secured our first $145,000 for the next 10 months of this beta. And where are we going now? 10 families and 10 homes by the end of 2018. And with the goal of validating this concept, building the technology to make this process a lot less, a lot, a lot less difficult and, and make it much more frictionless. And then also understand the unit economics so we can figure out how to scale in other secondary and tertiary, tertiary cities across the nation. Thanks. So uh, I don't know if you've looked at Devon Bank. They have a similar model in Chicago, and uh, they're guidance financial. There are some other banks like that that are getting into this. Mm -hmm. And one of the big markets you have is that there are a lot of traditional uh, conservative Muslims who do not pay interest or don't like to pay interest. So you have a huge market in that, and there are some big banks that are getting into it. Okay. Have you looked into that? Yeah, so I mean, I've looked into a lot of banks that get into it on the traditional side, you know, as in the, um, and most banks don't, I mean, like I said, they don't get into it. I haven't looked into that bank, so I definitely will have to look into that one. Um, but so the only way, all the banks I've spoken to, regional as well as some national ones, they've all said, this is more like a grant. Like we, we do it because we've had this customer for seven years or whatever it is, but we won't advertise that we do this and we actually take a huge loss from it. But I will look into that ba that bank. <laughs> um, can you clarify who is the owner of the home while the buyer is making the payments and yep. what the economics are for that party? Yeah, so the owner of the home is a separate fund. Um, it's held in this corporate structure for the duration of the contract. Um, and the greatest part about this is that we we are, because it's an equity-driven process, we're able to realize that equity and kind of cash people out of this equity. Um, is that, does that answer your question there? Yeah, and, and oh, the economics. It's a five-year term for the investors um, with the opportunity to refi into a separate pool. Um, they get a 10% return about with, of course, South Bend taking that first loss position, if any. Um, yep. I'm so sorry, that was time. Oh. Very nice, though. Thank you, Jada. Okay, next up is Mitchell with Living Lab. Mitchell, whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you so much, Howie. So my name is Mitchell Gorecki. Uh, quick background about myself. I was Duke 2013. I studied biomed engineering, mechanical engineering, economics, and finance. Uh, I went to a uh, startup that did RTB online advertising, uh, which is where I got kind of all of my knowledge for uh, creating marketplaces. Uh, and while I was there, I round in, wound up with this interesting problem, uh, which was solving my own rent issue. Uh, I was living in this house. It was 950 bucks a month in rent. Uh, couldn't afford it, and so obvious thing said, let me find roommates online. Uh, I wound up with 36 applicants, because I mean, you, you ask people to pay 316 bucks a month, and a lot of people respond. So found 10 people I liked. They were doctors, consultants, and lawyers. Uh, and then the economist to me said, okay, well, there's too many of you, uh, not enough bedrooms. You guys figure out what the true price of these bedrooms should be. And what I wound up with was three guys paying me 900 bucks a month. So you're pulling 2,700 down on a property that costs you 950 that you don't actually own. Uh, so how do you automate this process? How do you scale it? Why, why, are, why is this even existing? Uh, and that gets into the problem. 
which is that the process of renting property with roommates is really miserable. You've got this huge mess of a quick changing market. You can't find people you trust. You need someone who's not going to default on you or steal your clothes. Uh, so how, how do you pull this all together? Uh, and that's where we come in. We are a platform for creating and managing uh, co-living contracts. So let's take a little look about what we actually built. Uh, I'm going to hopefully get this demo to work. We essentially have an iOS platform uh, that, given a user profile, is able to make recommendations uh, for your living arrangement. So uh, we'll take the perspective of Joe here. Joe downloads the app, and he gives me things like, OK, well, what's your budget? What's your timing? Uh, where do you want to live? And he gets recommended these two people in this property. So mind you, we're having to match the people and the property, and then the people into the bedrooms honoring all of the preferences in the system. Uh, but what if it's not perfect? You, you look at someone's profile and you say, eh, you know, I'm not really in love with this Lucas guy. Uh, kick, kick him out of my recommendation. Give me a new person. So I need to find a replacement that honors that group for budget, location, timing, preferences, personality. Uh, and you do the exact same thing for the property. You might say, eh, I'm not in love with this. I don't really trust the property manager. Um, Give me a new recommendation, but that recommendation must also honor the rest of the people in that group. Well, there you go. And so once you find a group you really, really like, you can say yes to it. And then that triggers a process where we have to say, well, OK, Daniela and Katie, well, what do you guys think? And so you essentially ask the question to them to try and build out these clicks and groupings of people and rental contracts that make sense. Uh, and so then, of course, you're able to chat with the groups when you get a mutual match and apply on the platform. And we take a security deposit to make sure everything goes seamlessly. Uh, but essentially, this is the technology we have built to solve this problem. Uh, so the question we always get now is, well, does it actually work? Uh, and so we'll dive into the pilot. Uh, we've got 3,500 properties on the platform. We've got 320 users. Uh, oh. There, there we go. go. Uh, so we've got 3,500 properties. We've got 320 users. It's trying. There you oh, go. there we go. Woo. Um, and so we, we qualify uh, people based on how many actions they're providing on the platform. So on average, these guys are providing 36 actions uh, per user. Uh, they've created 750 matches, of which 83 have applied and 42 have signed to process almost $300,000 in rent. Uh, the really fun part being is we're able to do this in about 48 hours uh, and per bedroom, so 42 bedrooms. Uh, so then the question you ask is, well, okay, how do you make money doing this? Well, we've essentially built a marketplace. So there's three ways to do this. There's directly through the tenant. So you can offer them things like, well, insurance that's structured correctly. So that way if your roommate burns the house down, you're not liable for it. Uh, you can do this through the tenant. So for small uh, mom and pop shops, that's percentage of rent. Uh, or SaaS model for your bigger players, uh, and then externally through the actual lead gen for things like uh, moving support. Uh, I love the people I get to work with. My favorite stat about us is that the sum of our uh, kids, spouses, and dogs is zero. Uh, thank you, Howie, for providing our office space. It's been incredibly helpful. Uh, where we are right now, we're really good at making these shared living arrangements. We recently closed a seed round, and in the next four months, we're going to be looking to raise a Series A. Thank you very much. All right. Questions from the panelists? I think I know the answer, but how do you plan to scale and then monetize? Uh, so scale for us comes on supply and demand. So on the property side, the supply side, it's working with these large real estate uh, owners such as Graystar. And so the value pitch to them is pretty clear. It's lower vacancies, higher rates, lower risk. Uh, we, so we've, we've had a 100% success rate with signing up landlords at this point. On the actual tenant side, uh, it's creating this, this system that kind of has this appeal to it and making these transactions really, really seamless and easy and keeping you in that network and helping you live with the people you actually want. Uh, so taking, you, taking the risk out of finding somebody random on Craigslist. Uh, mechanically, we anticipate doing that through social networks, uh, lots of events, and, and kind of building up that brand. So the, the hard thing about all of these roommate platforms is, is in creating the liquidity and the timing, right? Theoretically, if you had perfect penetration of both uh, supply and demand, it, it shouldn't be too hard of a matching problem. So I guess you know, you're just starting to get into some of that. But like tactically, what have you been doing and what has worked in terms of creating uh, enough liquidity so you can actually make these matches? And when you don't have that liquidity, what's the other option? Right, like when you have someone who's engaged, active, looking for either a place or looking for roommates, and you can't create that match, 
do you lose that person from your platform or can you do something you know, interesting or innovative to direct them to an alternative option? That was the last question. So I'm going to take those questions backwards. When we have an issue, uh, we get to see all of the data, and we can see all of the effort, and we can see all the connections you're trying to build. Uh, and we essentially have a team that manually steps in and helps you through that process to build that connection. Uh, so we essentially become your advocate in finding a place to live to make sure that uh, you get a good experience. Uh, in terms of how do you get that liquidity, uh, it's just about having enough uh, supply to actually support the demand. When we initially launched this, we ran out of bedrooms in the first two days. Um, we realized, okay, well now we can take the, the successful stories we've had, pitch that to landlords, and now we have 10x the, su the supply of the properties to solve that exact issue. All right, thank you, Mitchell. <laughs> okay, next up is Nikhil with NVIDIA Impressions. All right, second Nikhil. Uh, so my name is Nikhil. I, <laughs> I uh, went to Duke undergrad. After that, I uh, became a professional dancer for a year, got a lot of uh, YouTube views, made no money, then went to <laughs> work at Microsoft and went to uh, go to Fuqua when I decided to create this business to help people who were creators like me, people who made videos online, dance videos, yoga videos, cooking videos, get them their fair share of the revenue. But to figure out how we do that, we have to talk about everyone's favorite topic, digital advertising. So the reason we went from billboards to digital ads is because we could target the people you wanted with your ads. Now, one of the most famous types of digital advertising is affinity-based advertising, so targeting people who are, in, who are looking for healthy things, for example. However, that's not very accurate and not very specific. Imagine you're one of our clients, uh, they make yoga mats, and you go to Google and you want to target health and fitness buffs. Well, 52% of the United States is in the health and fitness buffs category in Google. Uh, you don't need a CDC number to tell you that that's not true. But it's not just the lack of accuracy, it's also that it's not specific. If you're selling yoga mats, you want to target the 10% of people who are actually into yoga. right? So how do you solve the problem for the creators to make money and solve the advertisers' problems? Well, that's what InVideo Impressions does. What we do is we go to people who make videos, we make a bunch of deals with them, we figure out who watches those videos, then we create audiences like people who just watched someone cook a salad with ranch dressing and sell it to the people who sell ranch. And then we take that money and we uh, revenue share it with the video providers um, and that's the way everyone is happy. So. We have access to thousands of videos that we've made deals for. We have access to videos that have over 3.9 billion views on them, and we have more than 50 million people a month watching the videos we have access to. To give you an idea um, of a comparison, the closest thing that you can buy today is people who watch televisions, television shows. It's not as specific, and the largest number you can buy is 11 million per month. Right? So once we do take these uh, channels, we make a bunch of audiences, including for Duke Basketball over there. Um, and we have a user interface. So the agencies or buyers go into this user interface, they decide who they want to buy, right? Once they buy these audiences, then when they go to this, which is, for those of you in advertising, Google AdWords, your Google Ad system, once you go into the Google Ad system, these are our audiences. So this is an example of one of our customers who clearly creates virtual reality headsets and is really into targeting people who watch their competitors, uh, videos about their competitors being reviewed and then hitting them with an ad. So you, that happens instantaneously, essentially. Um, so we did all this, put this all together, and that whole product was deployed a few months ago, and we got to do a pilot with a Fortune 15 company. And what happened was when you, they gave you the ads where you have to click them, for those ads, there were 2.3 times higher amount of clicks. And then for the video display ads, people viewed them, i.e. they viewed 30 seconds of that video um, at a rate of 3.7 times more than in their original targeting, which was the Google Affinity targeting. Um, so then we've taken those numbers and we've tried to sell, 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 sell. Um, and we have deals with that provider as well as with Lululemon, Logitech, and Fresh Step. Um, with all of these people, we basically have done a pilot and now we're in the fun process of becoming an approved vendor so they can give us more than a few thousand dollars. Um, but what we're really trying to do is sell to any brand that we can, any agency that we can, now that we've proved 
that this can work. So if you know anyone in a Braden agency, that would be great. Um, and then after doing that, four, five, or six months, trying to prove that we have consistent revenue from a lot of customers, then we will look to race. Um, our team includes me, who worked at Microsoft, and it's a double dookie. It includes seven people, all of whom are dookies um, and have worked at a bunch of fancy places. And uh, thank you for your time. Uh, and to, just to recap, we are in video impressions. We're a bunch of dookies who help two groups of people. We help the people who make videos online make their money and help advertisers get better advertising. Thank you all. Um, ad tech's noisy, right? So I couldn't get a feel for what your actual product is based on the, so can you tell me what the product is? Um, what does it look like? What does it feel like? And then how do you stand out from all of the noisy kind of ad tech companies that are out there? Okay, so our product is the ability to buy audiences that are more recent and relevant so you can target your ads and you go here to buy the audiences and then those audiences are delivered directly into your ad system. That's the product. Um, in terms of the noise and how we stand out, uh, I think we're sta we stand out by being more recent and relevant, a combination of scale and more recent and relevant. We have a lot of scale because of the deals that we've made, and we're more recent and relevant because with our affinities, you can say this person just watched this video five minutes ago, which is better than a lot of what's out there. Um, you mentioned some of the uh, pilots that you've had and the um, potential, potential clients, but um, could you talk a little bit more about traction and maybe some revenue numbers? Yeah. So our revenue numbers are only 15,000 because basically with all of the, with the clients, we j basically just launched and we did a couple thousand dollar pilots so that they can test it. And then that just happened. And now we're in these vendor negotiations so that we can be an official partner so we can get more money. So uh, the way we sell it is we sell it $5 per CPM, so $5 per thousand ads run. Um, and that's the, the model, but our, those are revenue numbers. Okay, thank you, Nikhil. Cool. Okay, next up is Amy Hutchins. Thank you. Did you know that the construction industry is the only industry in the US that suffers from a productivity decline? and that 95% of projects are either over budget or over schedule. The culprit, people in the field and people in the office fail to share information real time, which causes communication failures. Construction industry is already starting to adopt technology, like drones and VR and 3D, but they're inundated with all of this new data that's still siloed in these point solutions. At Unearth, we're harnessing the power of this new technology to foster collaboration between the field and the office by bringing all the technology together in one place. Our browser-based solution allows ingestion of all types of progress data on our platform, from 360 photos to drone surveys to virtual reality walkthroughs, and all of that data is associated with its specific place on the job site in our software called OnePlace. Now, any stakeholder can look at what's happening on a job site, past, present, or future, and have one place to go to find it. Let me tell you about some of our customers. So Ed owns a heavy civil construction company down in El Paso, Texas, and was building a stormwater drainage dam system for the city. When he submitted an invoice for more earth excavated than was originally estimated in the bid, it was rejected. Now, Ed knew that that original estimate provided by the city was based on a survey from 1972. So his calculations were likely correct, but he had to prove it. With Unearth, he had before and after drone surveys in the software and was able to use volumetric comparisons to show exactly how much earth was excavated. He also had photos from the job site of trucks full of earth leaving the site. With both of those two pieces of data, it was enough to convince the city that he had actually excavated that much. So with that, he avoided legal fees, litigation, potential court time, and instead was promptly paid the $300,000 overage charges he was due. 
Addison is a foreman up in Seattle building a large residential construction project, and he was creating work plans in on Earth for his team for that day. He noticed a mismatch in the landscaping plans and the architectural plans, and had his team continued with their work, it would have caused them to need to rip out the work and redo it over again. Rework is one of the biggest culprits of schedule overruns and budget overruns in construction. So with Unearth, he was able to immediately notify the project manager to get the plans fixed and quickly rerouted his team to work on other areas of the site to keep on schedule. My co-founders and I started Unearth two years ago in late 2016. Brian, our CEO, grew up on construction sites. His father and grandfather owned heavy civil construction sites. Before this, we were all part of a successful startup that was acquired by the Priceline Group. And when we had finished transitioning the team through the acquisition, we decided to start on Earth. We uh, spent most of 2017 working with some strategic partners to refine our product. We launched in January, and since then, we've seen 30% month-over-month growth in our product, product usage as well as our customer base. We have three of the top 25 construction companies in the US actively using our software, and we've also signed Katera, which is a construction startup that's already raised $865 million to change the way buildings are built. If you'd like to hear more about Unearth and how Unearth is revolutionizing construction, visit unearthlabs.com or come see me afterwards. Thank you. Great, uh, great questions. Um, so, of the pieces involving, you know, drone footage capture, mapping, volumetric, um, you know, photo. Uh, gametry design, like how much of that has to be done in-house versus how much of you, how much of that can be outsourced to other vendors? AKA, are you building the full stack of every piece that needs to, you know, offer one turnkey solution for a, a, a construction site worker, or are you also turning out and using vendors who offer those services already? Well, the goal is to offer a one turnkey solution for all of that stuff, but we leverage vendors in order to do that. So for instance, we have three different vendors that do photogrammetry, which is uh, processing drone photos, for those of you who don't know. Right now, um, we have a strategic partnership with one of them who we prefer. And so if a customer comes to us and says, I want to use drones on my um, site, I don't know how, not only will we find the drone pilot for them, but we'll take those photos, process it for them, and handle the whole thing. more quick one. How long are your sales cycles and is that one of the bigger challenges that you guys are facing? Bingo. Yeah. Uh, sales cycles are long but we found some interesting ways to uh, improve sales cycles. I would say uh, we're working with, since we're working with a lot of enterprises, we've actually had nine months which we think is pretty good for enterprise sales cycles but um, we're working on that. Thank you, Amy. Okay, we have a uh, presenter change here. So instead of Brain Build um, and Joe Lamb, we're going to have uh, Rejection Therapy with Jia Zhang. Just got rejected by the screen. <laughs> so. it's, I think it's thinking. All right, it's thinking. So what Rejection Therapy will make people confident? All right, so uh, before I start, let me ask you a question. How many of you like rejection? Raise your hand. <laughs> A couple of people, okay, weirdos. Um, so I have been, most of you aren't, but I have rejection, the fear of rejection uh, haunting me my whole life. And so much so that I even delayed my dream to start my own company for a long time. And even after starting my company, I, after first rejection was the investment, the first thought is I gotta quit. That's already dawned on me. Wow, I gotta solve this problem. I really have a problem here. So what did I do? I uh, Googled, you know, Google's my friend. And I found this thing called rejection therapy. Basically, it's a deck of cards. 30 cards is invented by this Canadian entrepreneur. He's got some real rejection issues. And so this, this idea is, if you, come, uh, if you do go look for rejection once per day for 30 days, by the end of it, you will desensitize yourself from the pain of rejection. You will become a badass. You know, I said, that's a great idea. I want to be the badass ass of them all. So, 
I did this for not, not for 30 days, I did it for 100 days. <laughs> I filmed myself doing this um, and I made a video blog out of this thing. So I would, uh, I would start by you know, asking a stranger, can I borrow $100 from you? Then uh, one day I fi after finishing a burger, I said, can I get a burger refill? And then there's another day, um, on Super Bowl Sunday, I, I went to a stranger's house and I said, hey, uh, can I join your party? I, I brought my own chips. Um, <laughs> I got rejected by those. But the thing is, as I kept doing this, my confidence soared. I was a changed man. And I was so much better at negotiation, I got a lot of yeses. For example, one day I, I, uh, I uh, had a soccer ball in my hand and I went to a stranger's house and I said, can I play soccer in your backyard? And he was like, sure, why not? <laughs> and then just, another day I talked to a police officer and then talked to him and I said, can I drive your car? You know, he's like, sure. <laughs> and then I, I, one day I even went to a, a Krispy Kreme uh, and a donut shop. I asked them to make me donuts that looked like Olympic rings and they did it. I didn't make this up, I have this video evidence. You can go to my YouTube channel to see them. Um, there are over, over the years, I got over 10 million views on, on my videos. And they went viral, and because of that, I became this rejection expert. So I published a best-selling book, and I went to, over the past few years, I went to over 150 different companies and events and uh, schools to teach people how to become rejection-proof. I even uh, uh, gave a TED Talk. Uh, it was the number three most viewed TED Talk of 2017. It's not like I counted or anything. Um, <laughs> but, but because of this, thousands of people started doing rejection therapy all over the world. And they, they're telling me, wow, this thing is awesome, but wow, the rejection therapy is hard. It's, I mean, after looking at this, it's like, this is just a deck of cards, it sucks. You know, there's nothing personable, right? There's nothing uh, customizable. What if I can build an app that really uses the sharing, the customization, and the personalization that can make this work for everyone? That's what I did. I went to the owner of Rejection Therapy. I acquired all the intellectual property and the cards from him, and uh, I, I made him an offer he could not refuse. Um, there's no dead horse in the bed. Um, so we rebranded the Rejection Therapy um, uh, in Lion. We're prototyping our app. Uh, but while we're doing that, I started testing this using SMS on, on different people. And, uh, and just after a week, they started doing this amazing thing that started to happen. They started doing things that never thought was possible. And some of them were telling me that the result, they were crying. They were like, wow, it's, this made a profound impact in my life. So basically what we did is, we strip away the fear from people and we create a powder kick of human desire. And it has all kinds of applications in different areas, especially for women. In fact, there are more, a lot of women telling me, wow, we got confidence issues in the corporate world. This will really help us. So there's a huge opportunity there. So you might be asking me, what kind of business are we in, right? Well, we're in the $100 billion, um, $11 billion self-help industry. You might, be, you might know this, these apps. In fact, actually, these are the fastest growing apps out there. Uh, collectively, they, they're well over a billion dollar in valuation. But they're all like meditation apps. They're in the ice business. They're trying to calm you down. We're the opposite. We're trying to get people fired up. We're trying to get people going. We're in the fire business. <laughs> so, um, so, how do we, so how are we doing this? Um, you know, we, we have 50 million video views, and uh, we have uh, 60,000 subscribers to my um, blog. 4,000 of them volunteer to test my app, and um, I tested them on 250 of them. Uh, most of them are women, actually. Uh, you know, we have pretty good NPS score. 65 is good with NPS. And 10% of them actually bought. Uh, you know, after just a week. They, they start paying us month to month. So this is my team. Um, the most of them are st we still have a, a, in a, Duke, uh, a Duke degree. As we grow, hopefully, uh, probably not gonna stay that way. But uh, the thing is, we, are, we, have, we have the solution to one of the biggest problems for all mankind, of all ages. And we're developing the technology to, solve, to deliver that pro uh, solution to people. So we're inviting you into our journey. We're raising $500,000 in our angel funding. We have already raised 300. So uh, maybe the 200,000 will come from you. So thank you. So how do you protect your position? Because I see this is something that uh, what Facebook did to Snapchat, uh, somebody can do to you. Well, um, it's possible, um, but we're, we're very early. And also, um, I, 
I'm kind of a rejection personified. So, uh, so right, as, for, as of now, I own the rejection space in the mind share, right? If you Google rejection, you'll find me pretty early. But the thing is, of course, uh, there will be competition as we're doing this, right? So we have a huge lead in terms of mind share. We have a huge uh, in terms of branding. And also, um, you know, we're, we're starting early. So as anything, if, it, if it's a good business, we got to start quick and do it early. It isn't a question, but I think it's so interesting that you're approaching the problem from the perspective of telling people what they need, right? Like versus Headspace, which is like, you know, figure out how to kind of lower your, you know, um, anxiety or drive focus through meditation. You're telling people, hey, because, you know, we're all kind of, you know, getting rejected at various things throughout, you know, our day, our life that there's a way to kind of bulletproof yourself. So I, I don't know if that's the right uh, way to go, but it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it, we have a lot of results like with our early testing, right? So, um, I mean, I can tell people how to do stuff, but most important thing is we get people to do things. Right. Once they tap into their own, they just strip away the fear. They start doing their own things, which is really inspire our team. Uh, you know, they start doing things that's well, pretty amazing. It creates a positive dopamine response. You know, it's good. yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. One more question. Very quick, okay. very quick one. Um, other than um, in terms of uh, scaling and, and growing your your audience base outside of like the typical ones that you've mentioned that you have the the following and the and social um, and videos and stuff what else are you going to do what's what's your plan to scale it yeah content marketing is one of our our, our most important way to to drive uh, you know, to drive traffic you know we're really good at getting like people to read our uh, to read our blog and but also what we found is when people start doing this the one we have 250 testers so far they started blogging themselves they started like trying to brag and share uh, in fact we got two people quit their jobs and uh, one of them become a uh, a coach for rejection therapy within their company mm -hmm. just after uh, you know I mean just after a week because people start seeing it's like what are you doing this is amazing so that idea itself is very viral. So we're we're gonna we're gonna use the virality of this idea to keep growing. So thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Cool. Sorry, I'm behind you. Next up cool. is Olivia with Voyage. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Olivia Klupar. I just graduated with my MBA from Duke in May, um, and I am a co-founder of Voyage. Um, I'm gonna ask a question. Has anyone been to Alaska or been on a cruise to Alaska or desires to go to Alaska? Hopefully everyone. Um, I was born and raised in a really small town uh, called Skagway, so if you've ever been on a cruise, you've probably been to my town. Um, our town has 600 year on residents. Uh, in the summertime, we get a million cruise passengers or about 10,000 per day. And I spent the last 25 years, my parents uh, run some small businesses. We have a bed and breakfast, an art gallery, a tour company, and a restaurant. And I spent the last 25 years learning about small businesses, um, about the tourism and hospitality industry, and also about the cruise industry in Alaska and globally. I've observed that there is a very real and growing disconnect between the way travelers research and plan their vacations and the way small businesses market their offerings. Travelers are increasingly using online means and small businesses have not been able to adapt. So the predominant form of marketing for small businesses in our market is still print media. Um, we have brochures, coupon books, rack cards, newspaper ads, the cruise lines hand out a map, and then they do PowerPoint presentations just like this on the cruise while you're on the cruise. Um, and the challenge is that it's incredibly expensive. There's no data insight for the business, um, and there's no exposure before or after vacation. So the last three years, my brother and I have spent building the first e-commerce platform for small businesses in Alaska and in the cruise industry. We have a website that shares hyper-local, exclusive content that's not available anywhere else. Think of it as oral history that's been passed down from generation to generation, but never written down. Well, we're writing that local perspective down. And we have a mobile app that allows travelers to connect to local businesses and make purchases directly on their phone. 
Some of the features that we include on our app include the ability to research and purchase from an exclusive list of trusted businesses before uh, tours before they sell out, to shop online for in-store pickup or have your items conveniently mailed home. And if you're incredibly savvy, you can order your lunch ahead of time and have it ready for pickup during the lunch rush hour. When 10,000 people come to town, it's really hard to find a place to eat. So the travel market is incredibly large. It's competitive. Um, it, there's a lot of people in this space doing different things. The online market is over $800 billion in revenue, and that doesn't even include the local impact of different communities with in-store purchases um, that currently exist in each market. So how are we as a business able to differentiate, have an advantage in such a, a competitive space? We focus on two things, being local and being digital. So um, on the local side, we share the local perspective. There are a lot of blogs, travel blogs, travel writers, magazines, uh, online review sites that share the traveler's perspective. There's very few resources for people looking for the local perspective. That's what we provide. We work with really small businesses. Uh, a lot of these businesses don't have websites, um, and you can't buy their products on Amazon. On the digital side, this is re really critical. We have a platform that works with tour companies, restaurants, and retail stores uh, all on the same platform. Nobody else is doing this right now, and it's incredibly important because uh, as our prediction algorithm improves, we can make better recommendations based on consumer insight and shopping behavior. So if somebody buys a whale watching tour, you can remarket a whale tail pendant. Nobody's doing this right now. So how do we make money? Um, we charge a flat SaaS model price of 175 per month per business and then 10 to 20% commission on sale depending on the product. We also have a higher price point for brands. Brands have huge marketing budgets and they're very interested in pushing their brand to consumers. We launched the app uh, two weeks ago. We have over 30 paying businesses, 100 products in three cities, and we have plans to double our footprint in Alaska this summer and then launch in the Caribbean this winter. A lot of the businesses in Alaska move their inventory to the Caribbean market in the winter, and while Alaska represents 5% of global cruise capacity, Alaska, uh, the Caribbean represents 35%. So essentially what we've done is we've built a platform that works in Alaska that can be replicated in other remote destinations. So to conclude, we've bootstrapped this for the last three years. Uh, we've tested this for many years, and we finally launched a product that works and that businesses are willing and want to pay us to do. Um, we are now focusing our attention on growing the demand side of the platform. And so if any of you guys have experience in travel, um, mobile or e-commerce, e-commerce platforms or in scaling a two-sided marketplace um, or actually just want to talk about Alaska, um, please talk to me after. Thanks. What's your um, challenge right now with the, um, like getting the small businesses on the platform? I'm the only salesperson. <laughs> I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I've literally been on the road the last month. Um, they're very interested, uh, and I've had to sign them up one by one, but uh, as anyone who's worked with small businesses, they're kind of a pain to work with. They're inefficient, they're slow, they're, they're owners and operators of their business, so they don't have a marketing department. You can just get something approved. Um, and so I have a lot of local relationships, and that's a big advantage. People trust me because I'm local, um, but I, I need to scale a sales team. Much, Olivia. Thanks. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, last but not least is Lovitz. Hi, I'm Fernando Treva. I'm a Fuqua 2012, and I'm standing between you and Happy Hour, so bear with me, please. <laughs> um, what do we do at a glance? So Love It is a social commerce platform that makes it easy for people to discover and shop sustainable and ethical fashion brands. So you may think, why is this important? Why do I even care? Well, fashion is the second most polluting industry in the world. And just to give you some stats, the very blue jeans that you may be wearing today, it took 1,800 gallons of water to manufacture, a single pair of jeans. More than that, we're consuming 10 times more fashion clothing and garments than we were 10 years ago. And we're spending less money than 10 years ago. How is that possible? 
because people in the manufacturing chain are being squeezed by large corporations. So corporations are taking their manufacturing offshores to developing countries, and they're paying an average 30, second, uh, 30, sorry, 30 cents of a dollar per hour. And what is the problem here? That we are all part of this problem. As consumers, if we don't change the way we shop, if we don't make smarter decisions, we're going to continue killing the planet. So it is not that we want to do this. It is not that there are not efforts out there for changing or to improving this problem or solving this problem. There are many designers and many major brands that you, might, you may have heard of, like Stella McCartney or Adidas or Nike, that are trying to solve this, solve this problem. What is the problem? Is that they're not easily found. And we as consumers, we don't know which brands are making efforts in improving this problem or in solving this problem and making their products in a more sustainable fashion. So what do we do? We bring together the foremost ethically minded and sustainable brands in one single roof. And we give consumers the opportunity to give money back to the fashion industry to make it more sustainable with every purchase. Our value proposition is that we help you shop fashion in a responsible way. We bring information right in front of the point of purchase. So we inform you of brands that are changing the way people shop and that are changing the way things are being manufactured, the processes that they're following, the wedges they're paying to their employees. And we bring them all together in one single app. And every time you shop on Love It, we donate 2.5% of that purchase to Fashion Revolution and other organizations around the world that are working to solve this problem. So we select brands based on six different criteria. It would be sustainability, fair trade, ethically manufactured, handcrafted, locally made, humane, and inventive. We classify brands based on these criteria, and we present the information in front of the customer when they're browsing our website or our app, so when they buy a product, they understand the positive impact that they're creating. Our revenue model is very simple at this point. We make 15% of every sale. And the market is growing. Sustainable fashion is growing at 19% year-over-year growth compared to a 3% of the fashion industry. And not only that, some other brands and standalone companies like Patagonia or Cotton On or Reformation or Everlane have proven that people are demanding these products, more so millennials and Generation Z. So some of these companies have sold over $100 million in, in one year. Our milestones, uh, we have a revenue-ready product. We've sold $150,000 worth of product in 12 months. We've shipped over 670 orders and have 42,000 customers today. We're available in the US and in Mexico. Our goals for the round that we're raising today is to engage 25,000 monthly active users and to reach a million dollars in sales. We're going to do this by uh, continuing with our strategy in content marketing and also by opening a concept pop-up shop in Los Angeles and another one in Mexico, where we're going to be rotating the designers on a monthly basis, and we're going to be offering keynotes and engaging with the local community to help them be more sustainable. So being more sustainable is not about only the, the clothing that you're buying, it's how you're taking care of that clothing, how you're disposing the clothing, where you're recycling or you're donating clothing for a second use. Our team has the right experience in the right places, we have serial entrepreneurs in the team. Me, myself, I was marketing director for eBay for over four years. I helped them launch in over 18 markets around the world in emerging markets, including Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, Russia, and China. So we're raising a $2 million round. We've raised so far 1.7 million in our previous round. In this round, we have a, a lead investor in Palo Alto uh, that is investing a million dollars, and we're still looking for another million dollars. So if you're interested in learning more, Please come and ask any questions. Thank you. Questions? So totally understand the model to aggregate and be a discovery platform. Um, at what point do you think about expanding that 15% uh, take uh, by potentially moving into your own products or, or thinking about discovering products or sourcing products? Are you just planning on right now being the aggregator? Um, 
Yeah, more than uh, launching our own products, uh, from a revenue standpoint, what we're planning to do is to sell data to these brands to help them understand what sells and where so they can make smarter decisions in the manufacturing so they reduce waste in the manufacturing process by doing better forecasting and better product selection. So that's one of the things. And another thing is by opening the concept pop-up shops, our margins are, are higher. So we're making 45% um, on each sale. Uh, just to give you some numbers, in Mexico we opened a pop-up shop that lasted for 10 days. We sold uh, $25,000 worth of product and we made 45% of that. Clothing can have a lot of stops on the way from bells of cotton all the way through. How do you actually verify and assess uh, and re reliably demonstrate cruelty-free or you know ha harm? Or yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And we only work with brands. So before we onboard a, a brand into the platform, we work with them, we do research on them, and we very verify their claims. So we see if they have certificates by the World Trade for uh, World Fair Trade Organization, or if they're working with any other association like Somos Via or Fashion Revolution, that are certifying that the claims that they're making are true. Very good. Thank you so much. Let's give Fernando a round of applause here. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen next. The judges are gonna go away for about 10 minutes. Monica, if you could lead the charge. Dave Perkins, Nick Milionis, Chase. Matt Coyden, if you want to join, the Melissa and Doug entrepreneurs that are here, Oscar, Mackenzie, Scott, please go ahead and join them for a 10 minutes uh, decision making thing. And they're going to give feedback to each of the companies in order of when they presented. So go ahead and go with Monica here. And meanwhile, you in the audience are going to have a chance to vote. And then afterwards, we're going to do group Q&A with all of the presenters up here. Thank you, Jake. And if we have time. All right, we're going to close it there. And uh, congratulations to NeuroPlus on winning the Audience Choice Award. Let's give a round of applause. All right. Very good. OK. So we're going to have the panelists give feedback to each team, I think, in order for, of when they presented. And then they're going to let us know who the winning team is. We're going to take a quick photo of all the teams and presenter and panelists together, and then we're going to go to Schroeder's for a fun after party. Oh, and they're going to present a little bit differently. So now I'm going to let Robert step up and tell us how he's going to present. Um, so I will start with, um, with rejection therapy. Can we uh, have all the teams come up here, over here? Ja, come on up here. So, so Ja, your, your presentation was great. The enthusiasm, you really brought it to life. Um, ultimately, we decided that um, uh, the, the lifetime value of your customers, given that they'd be doing this therapy and hopefully build their confidence, and, and we, we didn't really see how this becomes a big business with recurring engagement. So, that, that was, so that's a pro and a con. Um. That's rejection. <laughs> 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 awesome. Okay. But, um, so let's skip to the next uh, is. Okay. Um, I am giving feedback on Love It. Um, Fernando, come on up. Fernando. Um, and so I think uh, right now you're you're kind of tackling this space at a really interesting point in time since there's a lot of um, general consumer awareness and focus on sustainability. So I think it is a you're kind of catching it you know right at the the beginning of this wave. Um, I think two things that could be uh, incorporated into the pitch to make it just a little bit stronger. One is you touched briefly on analytics, whether that's online or through physical pop-up and brick and mortar. I think that piece of it uh, could be really interesting, right? Like the more you're able to dive into retail analytics and um, gather insights and feedback from consumers as to how they're interacting with these brands and products, um, that piece of it could help you ultimately phase into you know other ways to monetize the data that you're collecting from you know aggregating these uh, these brands. And then I think the second you know, as I mentioned my question, um, you know, really strong to start off um, just as an aggregator play, but most e-commerce as well as physical uh, commerce players ultimately use the information that they collect to think about what improvements or what gaps there are in the market. And so that piece of it could be really interesting for you down the line as well. 
Um, so I'm going to do a voyage. Uh, so Olivia really enjoyed the presentation. I think that the app and value makes a lot of sense. As with any uh, small business oriented company, figuring out how to scalably acquire these businesses and simultaneously also figuring out uh, how to acquire users is, is the problem. Um, and unfortunately, in your presentation, you spent um, so much of the time just describing the, the product solution that you didn't have a chance to get into your strategies there. And I think that's a extraordinarily important in uh, helping figure out you know, what, what your opportunities for success for are. All right, and guess I'm going to also do uh, IVI with uh, Nikhil number one or two. Uh, two I don't know. Uh, Nikhil number two. Um, and so it, it seems like there's some value there, but I guess, I guess the feedback we give you is, is twofold. First, um, it wasn't made explicitly clear how you uh, intend to scalably acquire uh, the video content. And then again, in this five minute window, um, just the long term durable differentiation relative to what all these uh, behemoths can do. Um, very good. OK, so um, I'm going to quickly do rejection therapy. You, you have a lot of customers here. Um, just, just kind of like. Uh, <laughs> now, Robert, Robert did rejection therapy yeah, once. Yeah, 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 no. But you're I'm redoing. Just, okay. I, I was just putting oh, a plug for him. I just putting a plug for him. That's, that's all. Uh, what, what, I, what I'm really doing is, which one am I doing? Uh, bone health. OK, bone health. So I, I think you have a lot of potential in that product. I, I would really like you to think about segmenting your market and pricing differently. Uh, if everybody is saying the price is great, uh, then you are charging too little. Uh, also, given how often and how uh, people are using it and how many how few minutes they spend during the week, there should be a lot of uh, opportunities for you to uh, have a station and gym where people can pay uh, by the time that they use or on a subscription basis so you can monetize the one unit over a long period of time. OK, next up, Bob, okay. I think. I am doing Living Lab. Mitchell. Oh, no, not yet. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you, you will, but in a second. Um, so uh, first, before that, um, hurry home. Um, great business, huge market, and really meaningful impact that a business could have. So that's always a great plus. Um, my feedback is that for any marketplace, it's really um, important that every side of the marketplace benefits from the platform. So my feedback is to show in the presentation how all the stakeholders um, benefit from your business coming to the world. Very good. Now. So now. Yeah, it's on. Now we are. Um, getting to the um, the top three so I will um, I want to address the um, the second runner-up and um, that is neuro plus congratulations um, <laughs> really like the the space here and the team and um, what you're working on and kind of you know the meaning how meaningful it is um, and personal coming from some gaming background also like that. Um, so, um, you know, great stuff. We, we had, um, you know, some concerns on the scaling and the kind of the hardware in the mix and um, some of the studies that some of, um, some of the, um, some of us had some concerns about the studies that were displayed. Um, but overall, you know, really, um, I personally love that you already have um, significant numbers and traction and revenue. So um, I think you have exciting stuff ahead. So great presentation and congratulations. And, and just one more passing comment. Uh, well done in terms of the presentation and actually articulating where you are today, how much you're going to raise, and where that's going to take you. If you're going to ask us for money, please tell us what it's going to get us. Great. Thank you, Jake. OK. <clears throat> Living Lab, Mitchell, we love the market you're going after. Um, and I've, I've had a little bit of view, and I think some of the other judges um, have had a view into um, uh, the product and uh, the business for um, kind of two cycles now. And you're getting closer. Uh, for us, it really came down to um, a question of do the metrics today 
um, sort of support um, uh, a Series A investment and um, the fact that you've raised a seed round and you're going to be able to position yourself to go delivered on, uh, deliver on the geographies um, that you've um, sort of set for yourself as, as the goals, I think are going to give um, a lot of us um, uh, you know, a lot more to chew on. Um, you're going to raise more money, and you're going to build a great company, and I'm looking forward to watching you do it. Yep. Great. So it's obvious who the number one, our winner is tonight, on Earth. So. Woo. Um, you did a great job in a few areas, and that's what kind of sold us all. And what are the two words that are usually discussed in like with obscenity and, and crush and crushing tones? Time and money. Right? And you took those two words and you made them a central part of your presentation about how you save time and money. You gave concrete examples that we all really took, in, took to heart. The opportunity, you also presented the opportunity as being massive, which it is. Construction is a, is a massive opportunity. And when you know, I happened to raise the one criticism, you actually owned it. You said, yeah, it's a problem. We know it. We're working on it. So you really tackled a bunch of these difficult areas really well, and you impressed us all. Um, the one unusual situation is we had to look at, you know, we had to evaluate the company without meeting the CEO. Um, so we evaluated you, and we, you obviously did a great job. So thank you so much. I'm trying to think of anything else that I might say about it. Um, you did a great job. Thank you for being here, and congratulations on being the winner. <laughs> Woo! Congratulations. All right. <laughs>